Recently, the chief rabbi of South Africa denounced the Pope in Rome and the Archbishop of Canterbury in England. It's a sad day when two of the main spokesmen for Christianity in the West are rebuked for their unbiblical views. We really shouldn't be surprised, however, because the Bible predicts a great apostasy in the last days. And it's vital that any professing believer should understand the times. The Jerusalem Channel is made with the support of you, our viewers. Thank you for watching. Shalom, I'm Christine Darg. The head of the Roman Catholic Church and the leader of the Church of England are effectively rejecting the Bible by supporting policies that negate the connection of the Jewish people to the Holy Land. That's according to Dr. Warren Goldstein, the chief rabbi of South Africa. The rabbi's theological critique comes after Justin Welby, the Archbishop of Canterbury, endorsed a ruling by the International Court of Justice that Israel's presence in certain biblical territories is unlawful. Well, it's time to understand the times. You may have heard previously about my call to the nation of Israel. Years ago, during a period of fasting and prayer, I experienced an epic dream. And in the dream, I was standing on Mount Zion and I saw angry nations shaking their fists because the Jews were once again in possession of Jerusalem and the Promised Land. In the dream, suddenly I heard the Lord say that I must stand with the persecuted people of God when all nations turn against Israel. And that's where we've come to today. Just as Psalm 2 says, the nations are raging against the Lord and against His anointed. And the dream taught me, in certain words, that there is a hegemonic spirit wanting to usurp the entire Holy Land. This evil spirit covets and usurps the Holy Land that was given specifically and exclusively to Israel by God. Israel's enemies are a hegemonic spirit wanting to take over all the territory. This spirit wrongfully claims all of the Promised Land for itself. For example, maps in Palestinian textbooks pretend that Israel doesn't exist. What God said to me in my life-changing dream is what He wants all Bible-believing Christians to do, and that is to stand with Israel when all the nations turn against Israel, as the Bible predicts. This is the biblically correct position, even if all the nations are politically correct. With more war happening all the time, now is the time to understand the times we're living in. And Israel is on the front lines of warfare. And in the Bible, the Lord answers the question about what's going to happen before Jesus comes back to establish his kingdom on earth. You see, everything is precipitated on the fact that there is a future kingdom. A return of Jesus to establish his kingdom on earth in order to fulfill all messianic prophecy. When Jesus came the first time, he did not fulfill all of the messianic prophecies. He fulfilled only the ones pertaining to God's suffering servant, as described in Isaiah chapter 53. But in the Gospel of Luke, the angel Gabriel prophesied to Mary, the mother of Jesus, that God will give her son the throne of his ancestral father David, and that hasn't happened yet, but it will happen when Jesus returns to set up his worldwide government in Jerusalem. The question posed by my new book's title, Lord, will you restore the kingdom to Israel at this time? That could not be answered in the affirmative by Jesus nearly 2,000 years ago because the gospel first had to be preached around the world. But now he's saying, yes, it's time for the restoration of all things, including the kingdom to Israel, just as the original disciples had hoped. So in this broadcast, I pose an important question to you, and I want you to consider, and that is, of what significance is the fact that once again, the world has a Jewish state? 
Biblically and theologically, the question is of utmost importance, especially since the Hamas atrocities committed on the 7th of October. Unfortunately, some stubborn churchmen also hold an erroneous position that's called replacement theology or supersessionism, claiming that God has somehow replaced his covenant people, Israel, with the church. Despite the fact that the true church of genuine believers is on life support via Israel's roots. In Romans 11:18, the apostle Paul admonished the church at Rome, "Remember, you do not support the root, but the root supports you." But many misguided replacement theologians ignorantly maintain that the nation of Israel today is theologically irrelevant. Anti-Israel clergy revealed their appalling ignorance of the Word of God and their ignorance also of the prophetic days in which we are privileged to live. They also reveal their ignorance of the character of Israel's covenant-keeping God. Since 1948, when Israel was reborn in a day, fulfilling Isaiah 66, 8, the God of Israel has given notice that the church age is concluding. Unfortunately, not every clergyman has read the memo as stated in the Bible. And in Luke 21, 24, Jesus declared that Jerusalem will be trodden down under the feet of the Gentiles, but only until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. And in Romans eleven twenty five, 25, the Apostle Paul stated that a partial blindness has happened to the nation of Israel towards the identity of Messiah, only until the fullness of the Gentiles is gathered into the church age. Well, the church age was inaugurated in Acts chapter 2, and it will end at the rapture of the church. Therefore, the church age is a limited window to win the lost, and the church age will end abruptly in the twinkling of an eye. While much of the world resists the recreation of Israel in its God-promised land, Most of the church has also been deaf, blind, and tragically mute about Israel's re-emergence on the world stage. And why? Dishonest churchmen have distrusted or disbelieved God's word, and this grieves the Holy Spirit. Christians who are faithful to the Hebrew Scriptures are inclined to love the Jews and support Israel. They appreciate that Christianity derives from Judaism, and is supported by our Hebraic roots. It's no coincidence that others who claim to be Christians but who do not respect the Hebrew Bible have no real and abiding affection for the Jewish people, nor do they understand why Israel is engaged in warfare at this time. It's tragic that while today's Islamists are murdering Christians and Jews, trying to conquer the West and posing a terrifying threat to civilization itself, Many European Christian leaders have decided to dump their Jewish parents and bizarrely embrace their would-be jihadi assassins. When church leaders abandon the Jewish people, it's because they have abandoned the Hebrew Bible and with it, all of its promises, all of its prophecies and the defense of Christianity in the West. As a Christian, it's an embarrassment to me that South Africa's chief rabbi, Dr. Warren Goldstein, recently had to denounce Justin Welby, the Archbishop of Canterbury, as well as Pope Francis for their rejection of biblical values. The rabbi wrote, quote, at a time when Europe's very future hangs in the balance, its two most senior Christian leaders have abandoned their most sacred duty to protect and defend the values of the Bible. Their cowardice and lack of moral clarity threaten the free world, end quote. But whether or not it is politically correct, the truth is God himself has committed himself for the long haul to the Jewish people and to the reconstituted nation of Israel. The Almighty has not abandoned Israel. The nation of Israel is not an anomaly on the political landscape. It is a fulfillment of Bible prophecy. And Israel is not occupied today by colonial people, but by the original possessors of the land. 
In fact, God states in his word in Ezekiel chapters 36 through 39 and elsewhere that he favors the return of the Jewish people to their promised land in the last days. Although God cares about justice and the fate of all people, including Israel's half-brothers, the Arabs, at the same time, he expects the Arab world who had plenty of territory to make room for the return of the Jews as prophesied. In fact, Israel's law of return is an undeniable precept in the Torah found in Deuteronomy chapter 30 and verse 5. It says, Then the Lord your God will bring you to the land which your fathers possessed, and you shall possess it. And he will prosper you and multiply you more than your fathers. Both Jesus and Paul taught that when the fullness of the Gentiles is gathered within the church, then the church age will be finished and God will faithfully take up Israel's cause again, heralding the return of Messiah. So I want to repeat Jesus' word on the matter because it's so important, found in Luke 21, 24. And they, he said, meaning the Jewish people, they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down to the Gentiles, he said, forever, no, just until the times of the Gentiles be completed. Similarly, the Apostle Paul warned and he prophesied in Romans chapter 11, verses 25 to 26. Brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel forever. No, he said, until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so Paul said, all Israel shall be saved. Therefore, Israel's ascendancy at this time is extremely serious and very timely for us to comprehend. It's happening before our eyes. I encourage believers to be wise and to invest time praying for the peace of Jerusalem. You see, praying for the peace of Jerusalem is part and parcel of the gospel. What happens in Jerusalem affects the moral progress of individuals and entire nations because it is to Jerusalem that Jesus will return and set up his millennial kingdom as prophesied in Zechariah 14.4. Therefore, no other city comes close to being as important as Jerusalem. Psalm 122 commands prayer for the peace of Jerusalem, the eternal capital of Israel. It's the capital of no other nation, never has been. And Jesus prophesied in Luke 21, 24, that Jerusalem will be in Jewish hands in the end times. In his Olivet Discourse, his disciples asked Jesus, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Israel was under Roman occupation. But Jesus answered that when the times of the Gentile nations are fulfilled, then... And only then will Jerusalem no longer be trodden down by the Gentiles. So every time we pray for the peace of Jerusalem, we are in fact praying for the return of Messiah. And we're praying for the shalom of Israel's sacred capital. Shalom means wholeness, complete, undivided. The nations want to divide Jerusalem, but God's will is to keep Jerusalem whole, intact, and unfractured under Jewish sovereignty. Well, recently the Jewish people went through the fast day called Tisha B'Av, the ninth of Av, on the Hebrew calendar, recalling the destruction of the two holy temples of Jerusalem. And according to the extra-biblical book, the Talmud, the first temple was destroyed in 586 B.C. because of the sins of idolatry, immorality, and bloodshed. But the second temple was destroyed in 70 A.D., because of what the sages call baseless hatred. This baseless hatred is considered a more serious offense than the earlier three sins that led to the destruction of the first temple. It took 70 years to rebuild the first temple, but the Jews are still waiting to rebuild the second temple even after more than 1,900 years. Why was the first sanctuary destroyed? Well, The rabbi said because of those three evils, idolatry, immorality, and bloodshed. But they say that the reason that the second sanctuary was destroyed 
even though the Jews were at that time occupying themselves with Torah observance, was because of hatred without cause. The sin of baseless hatred. Groundless hatred is considered worse by the sages than the three sins of idolatry, immorality, and bloodshed. That's according to the Talmud. Although the Hebrew phrase is often translated as baseless hatred, it literally means hatred of grace. So in essence, the sin of baseless hatred is the rejection of God's grace. And since Jesus, Yeshua is his Hebrew name, is the embodiment of God's grace, the Hebrew sin of baseless hatred is ultimately the rejection of his ministry. Is it any wonder then that he foretold the destruction of the second temple based on Israel's hatred and rejection of him? In Matthew 24, 2, Jesus prophesied, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Today, the main remnant of the outer western wall of the second temple courtyard is where people flock from all over the world to pray. It's known as the Wailing Wall, the Kotel, or the Western Wall. And scattered nearby are the remnants of the stones that were thrown down. One of these is inscribed with Hebrew, saying, To the trumpeting place. And this was uncovered during archaeological excavations at the southern foot of the Temple Mount. This stone once marked the place where a priest stood to blow a trumpet to usher in the Sabbath during the Herodian period. And these stones were thrown down by Roman soldiers in 70 AD as they were destroying the second temple. Well, immediately after his triumphal entry into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, Jesus went directly to the temple and he drove out all who sold there, overturning the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons and so forth. After this, the blind and the lame were able to enter, and the Lord healed them in the temple. But despite performing miraculous works of healing that day, including opening the eyes of the blind and causing the disabled to walk, the chief priests and scribes were indignant at his actions, and they sought to put him to death, according to Mark eleven eighteen, because they feared him, because all the crowd was astonished at his teaching. So in the evening, the Lord left the temple for Bethany, the hometown of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, his friends, where he stayed the night. The following morning, something fascinating happened. He walked back to Jerusalem, and being hungry, he saw a fig tree along the way. But he noticed the tree was barren without any fruit. So he rebuked the tree with these words, May no fruit ever come from you again. And immediately, the fig tree withered. That was very prophetic because only when the fig tree, which is a symbol of the nation of Israel, blossoms again will Jesus return. That's what he prophesied. And the withered tree was indeed resurrected in May 14, 1948. Well, Jesus returned to the temple where he was once again accosted by the religious establishment, questioning his authority. He turned the tables on his accusers by giving them a dilemma to solve. He asked, the baptism of John, was it from God or from man? They were unwilling to answer him. So then he prophesied the parable of the two sons in Matthew chapter 21, indicating that despite their supposed status as the good sons of Israel, even tax collectors and prostitutes would enter the kingdom of God before them. Jesus went on to say that the kingdom of God will be taken away from them and given to a people who will produce its fruits. The Pharisees and the Sadducees then attempted to entangle him in his talk and sent their disciples to ask him tricky questions. However, the Lord exposed their baseless hatred and continued to confound them. Then beginning in Matthew 23, he began his denunciation of the scribes and the Pharisees, pointing out their hypocrisy. And after he in his denunciation, he lamented for Jerusalem, saying, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen 
gathers her brood under her wings. But you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. After this, Jesus departed from the temple for good, and he never looked back. But in Matthew 24, his disciples made a last-ditch appeal for Jewish tradition and to maintain the status quo somehow by pointing out to Jesus the glory of the second temple. They said, Lord, look at these beautiful buildings. It was then that Jesus pronounced judgment on the temple and the Levitical system and predicted the Roman destruction of the temple in Matthew 24, verse 2. This was unfathomable to the disciples who somehow still consider Jesus to be a reformer of temple Judaism. They saw him as the one who would restore it so that the kingdom of God would finally manifest upon the earth. But in Matthew 24, Jesus went on to explain the signs of the end of the age that would precede the promised days of Messiah, otherwise known as the Messianic kingdom. He foretold that one day praise would rightly be given to him as Israel's true king, but only after the travail of the coming great tribulation upon the earth. Only after the Jewish people cry out to him as their Lord and summons him with Baruch HaBa Beishem Adonai, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, will the kingdom of God be established in Zion. So Jesus allowed history to destroy the temple because Israel denied the power and purpose of his greater sacrifice through baseless hatred. The Jewish sages had it half right. They said it was because of the sin of baseless hatred that the second temple was destroyed. And it was indeed baseless hatred that caused it. But that baseless hatred was, in fact, specifically the rejection of Jesus as Israel's king and savior. It's highly ironic that there's so much emphasis in Israel now on the temple, and many Orthodox Jews are saying, we are ready for Mashiach. But by rejecting Jesus, unfortunately, tragically, they will temporarily receive a false Messiah, even the Antichrist. But thank God their deception will not last forever. It will not last long because Jesus said those days will be shortened for the sake of the elect at that time. It's important to note that during his earthly ministry, the Lord referred to himself as the true temple of God that dwelt amongst us. And in Matthew 12, 6, he dared to tell the Pharisees that he was greater than the temple. And he challenged them with these words, speaking of himself, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. You see, Jesus was the Shekinah, the very presence of God manifested in the temple in human form. For in him, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. As the very Lamb of God, Jesus is also the substance and end of all sacrifice. When his flesh was destroyed on the cross, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, as recorded in Matthew 27, 50. Thereafter, access to the inner sanctum was made available to all who come in faith. We enter into the Holy of Holies by the blood of the Lamb. Amen. Well, my friends, although we keep watch over Israel and the signs of the coming of the Lord, The present state of this world is directly opposite to the life of faith in the Lord. Our duty is to live before the divine presence at all times, regardless of our circumstances. For those who trust in the presence of God, nothing happens to us by accident, randomly, or outside of our Father's care. It's important in our journey of faith that we make sure that we know the only Savior, Jesus, the Messiah. And in Mark 8, 29, Jesus asked each one of us, Who do you say that I am? And he waits for our answer. He waits for us to receive him. And how do we do it? Well, Jesus said in Revelation 3, 20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. The thought of dining together is truly Middle Eastern thinking of our Jewish Lord. In Mideast culture, sitting down to eat a meal with somebody is a sign of intimate friendship. 
Jesus also gave us his invitation in Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. He said, come to me, all who are weary and who carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Jesus calls out to the exhausted, the forlorn, the tired of heart, the downcast. If you feel you can't go on, he calls out to come to him for rest, and especially to all who are weary of religious duties. He says, put your trust in me, the Savior, and I will save you from all your sins and weariness. So may the love, peace, and grace of Jesus be upon you all and within you. And I want you to know that Jesus didn't die only for his kinfolk, the Jewish people, but he also died for the nations. He didn't suffer for a few, but for all mankind. The payment he made on Jerusalem's cross with his life's blood to purchase our salvation was more than enough to satisfy God's judgment against the sin debt of mankind. The Lord's atonement on the cross was sufficient, but listen carefully. His atonement is only efficient for those who believe. That's why faith is required. And God has designed the way of salvation to be as simple as ABC. The Bible says we must A, admit our sin and be willing to turn from our sins. Then B, we have to believe in our hearts that God raised Jesus from the dead. And C, Confess with our mouth, Jesus is Lord. So right now, or or before you go to bed tonight, I invite you to call upon the Heavenly Father simply as a little child and tell Him that you're willing to renounce sin. In childlike faith, say, I turn my back on sin and I turn my heart to Jesus. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Come in today. Come in to stay and fill me with your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I'd love to hear from you on social media, or you can contact us on your phones or tablets through our free Jerusalem Channel mobile app. In the meantime, we invite you to continue to find help at our website, exploits.tv, and also at our Jerusalem Channel YouTube site, you'll find a library of videos 24-7. And sign up for our weekly email alert called Exploits, based upon Daniel 11.32, declaring that people who know their God will be strong, not weak, and will accomplish exploits, meaning will do the works of the Lord in the remaining time before His imminent return. Don't forget to check out my articles at substack.com. Until next time, I'll always be contending for the faith and praying earnestly for the peace of Jerusalem. I'm Christine Darg. Shalom and Maranatha.